Um, thank you all very much for taking the time out of what I know are busy schedules to attend today. Um, we are very fortunate to be joined this afternoon for a look at um, issues around birth planning for those that lack capacity. Um, we are joined by two guest speakers. Um, first of all, if I can just say hello and thank you to Maria Booker, who is the Programme Director for Birth Rights, um, who are frequently involved and consulted in these matters and work to ensure that the rights of the women involved are properly promoted um, and taken into account. And then we also have Mr Kevin Phillips, um, who's a consultant and former, former Chief Medical Officer for the Hull and East Yorkshire NHS Trust with years of experience in obstetrics and gynaecology, um, looking at issues of this nature from a clinical point of view as to some of the problems that might um, arise. So just by way of a bit of housekeeping first, um, this is obviously being run on the Zoom webinar function. So um, if you want to participate, we'd love to be able to deal with some of your queries or really just to try and engage in some discussion as much as we can. Um, we have the chat box open and ready to use. Um, please put any thoughts, queries that you might have, practical problems that you come across in practice um, that you'd like to hear an alternative perspective on. It's not um, often enough, in my view, that we have non-lawyers um, available at this type of event that we can really pick the brains of as um, lawyers that see this, um, this work very much from a court perspective. So please do take advantage of that opportunity use the chat and if we can't deal with it as we're working our way through our individual presentations we'll come back to that at the end um, of the afternoon. Um, you should all be aware, I think you've probably all been made aware by a prompt on Zoom that the webinar is being recorded. You'll be sent out a link to the recording tomorrow and that will also include a link to any slides um, that we use so that you'll have that as a future reference point as well. All right, um, so just by way of starting then, if I let you know the format really for the afternoon, I'll just share my screen. So we have for the afternoon um, planned for the programme, um, the first 30 minutes or so, um, a very quick whistle-stop tour um, due to time constraints into the Court of Protection approach and just some of the recent decisions from this year um, so that you're aware of the up-to-date position um, as it's been decided in court. And then at half past three, I'll hand over to Maria to have a look at birth rights and its role and its unique perspective really and what it can bring to um, these discussions. And then at four o'clock, we'll move on to um, Kevin's talk in terms of the clinical approach and some practical problems that arise for clin clinicians who are expected to deal with um, these difficulties really very much um, on the ground as they arise for patients. And then we thought we'd leave the last 30 minutes for some questions and hopefully a bit of discussion about how it is that you find these issues, if there are any problems that come up in the course of your practice, things that you might like to know a little bit more about and obviously we'll deal with as much as we can while we're here today um, or else if you leave us food for thought we'll be, have to come back to you um, but we do as I say hope that there's um, certainly a lovely turnout this afternoon to be able to engage in some discussion as we go along. Right so just making a start then from the legal perspective um, and this is an area um, of particular interest to me um, on a personal level. It's um, an extremely fundamental issue to take birth planning decisions out of the hands of the woman and her family and to have to move towards best interests and to involve the court in an area of life which is normally um, very individual um, and up to individual patients. The starting point, obviously, for those of you out there who are regular court of, protect, court of protection practitioners, is around somebody's capacity and whether or not the mother involved has the capacity to consent to the treatment that's being proposed. Um, this isn't the time or the place to start descending into the details of the Mental Capacity Act, so we are going to assume a little bit of knowledge around that subject by virtue of the fact that you've all attended today. 
Um, but obviously, capacity evidence is going to be vital if a matter is going to come to court because it determines the appropriate jurisdiction. And often these type of emergency cases, if that is how it's being dealt with, um, mean that some of the groundwork is sometimes overlooked. And it's important to just remember that the court does still require um, information and evidence about a woman's capacity. Where there are concerns around capacity, but um, not necessarily evidence of a lack of mental capacity within the Act, then obviously it's necessary to just bear in mind the inherent jurisdiction um, and whether or not you need to go to the great safety net um, rather than dealing with matters under the Mental Capacity Act. I've just uh, included a very brief reference to that as a reminder, really. And to Section 48 there, as you can see, um, for any interim declarations. So these are decisions taken within the framework with which most of you will be very familiar. In terms of um, birth planning within the Court of Protection, they are, the, the cases that we see in court are um, treated as serious medical treatment cases. It's important, I suppose, just to remind ourselves though, that it's been said repeatedly now in case law, that not all instances of birth are serious medical treatment cases. That probably goes without saying. And it's really those where there are capacity difficulties combined with a serious dispute about matters such as the use of anaesthetic, admission, um, or the method of delivery, that an application to court would be appropriate. And we've got quite detailed guidance now from the Court of Protection as to what constitutes a serious medical treatment case and when disputes should be referred to the court, because um, as most of you are probably aware, certainly not each and every dispute um, has to go before the court. And the Court of Protection has been quite anxious to um, deter practitioners from putting every position, every decision before it. So it's always worth just going back to the basics. Um, if you are faced as a lawyer with, um, and I'm speaking about it from that perspective, with an application or a concern on behalf of an NHS trust uh, as to birth planning, you have, of course, the practice direction in terms of serious medical treatment cases, which gives you the framework um, for you to consider. And we also have guidance um, from Mr Justice Hayden um, as Vice President of the Court of Protection, setting out the um, guidance around serious medical treatment cases from January 2020, um, which makes it clear that there has to be um, proper forethought given to these applications and planning wherever possible. And the guidance takes you through um, if you look at it, I've given you the citation for it. It takes you through various situations where you should be considering making an application to court, um, such as where things are finally balanced, there's a difference of medical opinion, lack, lack of agreement and the like. And then it gives you the um, details as to allocation and urgent hearings and the like. So always refer back if faced with these sort of situations, which let's face it can arise in the small hours, um, in an emergency type situation, always refer back to uh, both the practice direction and the guidance given um, as your way into these. Now, I've referred just on the earlier slide to the case of FG from 2014. Um, and these are the categories identified within the case of FG, which um, in which the, some guidance was given by Key and J as to the um, instances when a case should probably be put before the court. And he identified four categories um, and I've set them out for you there on the slide. They're also contained within the judgment. And that judgment goes on in the annex to give you some detailed guidance really specific to birth planning um, as to what areas and when and how um, he even descends to the detail of what should be in witness statements and care plans. So it's extremely useful guidance annex to that judgment. Um, you can see the four categories there, um, and we'll just look at them in a little bit more detail. And these are occasions on which you might have to um, go to court. I'll just come on to, so category one, um, Keen Jane made the point that, um, sorry, I'll just go back, where the interventions proposed by the trust probably amount to serious medical treatment. 
and a consideration really of what that means beyond the practice direction. So it's pointed out that an uncomplicated planned C-section will not of itself um, amount to serious medical treatment, but it could become um, a case where there's either factors that mean that the mother faces a higher risk of complications or because of a psychiatric condition, the intervention proposed might cause a deterioration, um, causing her not to be compliant and a degree of force or restraint used. So those are features that we quite commonly see in the reported cases as being of um, very real concern. So these are instances where the clinicians will be concerned that they simply can't manage the risks um, in a way that would also meet the mother's expressed wishes, perhaps. And it was said within FG, and it's worth just reminding ourselves, although the case now is a few years old, um, the, in terms of the gravity of the decision that the court is being asked to make, it is a very serious interference with um, a mother's human rights. Um, and it's um, a category of case where applications should be made to the court um, where there is a plan for a cesarean section against um, a mother's wishes. We then got um, Key and Jay's breakdown really of the um, details of the second category of restraint a more than transient forcible restraint. And again, restraint is an area in which we see um, come up as part of the plans that um, might be put before the court. And it's often a very difficult area and that's featured in one of the cases that the, the courts have had to decide this year. Category three, the serious dispute. Again, I think that's um, probably a principle that we're all familiar with in terms of there being a serious dispute between obstetric care um, as to what obstetric care is going to be appropriate between um, clinicians and either the patient or her family or both. Um, and the court just reminded us there in the case of FG that it's not every dispute that, come, that has to come before the court, it's those of real substance. Um, disputes that are capable of being managed outside of the court, of course, um, don't need to. And then the final category being one of deprivation of liberty. So that gives you the framework in terms of the guidance that we have from the court for these cases. It's worth just reminding ourselves of a little bit of the history, maybe. Um, there were initially cases around um, what's commonly referred to in the press as four cesarean section cases. Um, in the 1990s and then more recently in 2012 um, some of you might be familiar with the REAA case which was a case involving an Italian mother um, and it found its way into the press and attracted an awful lot of media attention as being a case in which um, she was said to have been forced to undergo a cesarean section um, and then it came back into the press subsequently because um, Sir James Mumby went on to make an order for adoption of the child subsequently. Um, these cases are obviously always very emotive and they do attract um, a certain amount of press attention. As we can see, again, more recently, they continue to be of concern. And I've just included there a number of the um, cases during the 2000s, really, that um, are of significance and, and bring us really up to date. So I've already mentioned the guidance slightly. This, again, flows from the FG case. The, the guidance itself is very keen to stress that applications should be made in a planned way. And although that's seen sometimes in the case law, um, more often than not, these applications are made um, for what are sometimes said to be very good reason on an emergency basis when matters arise. And I know that's something that Kevin's going to talk about later in terms of what it's like on the ground to try to manage this difficult area. Um, Ideally, looking at the guidance, applications should be made no later than four weeks before the expected date of delivery or at the earliest opportunity. And clearly that's not always going to be um, practical. And indeed, as we saw earlier this year, um, in a case that we'll come on to, it's not always clear that the capacity issues are going to arise in such a stark way um, at quite such an early time. And then it's said within the guidance that um, the trust should take the following steps in order to comply with that timetable in terms of issuing the application, notifying the official solicitor and seeking directions and the like. Um, the court has spelt out now repeatedly the undesirable consequences of late or emergency applications. Um, and it said that they are to be avoided unless it is a genuine medical emergency. 
And one of the central concerns that they've had, which you see coming through in the authorities um, repeatedly, is the role of the official solicitor, because to have a um, out of hours hearing on an emergency basis seriously prejudices sometimes their attendance um, and the um, representation that P can have at that hearing, which makes it very difficult for the court to then take any sort of substantive um, steps. It also means, obviously, if we're dealing with out of hours applications, that directions um, are made on um, a footing without always having the optimal evidence before them. So for if, for example, the judge would prefer to go to adjourn to obtain further evidence and further details, it's incredibly difficult to do so if time is pressing. And I mentioned earlier that the guidance in FG gives you the content or guidance towards the content of witness statements and care plans. All right, so we'll come on just briefly then to um, a couple of the recent cases, which is what I just wanted to draw your attention to um, in the short time that we've got this afternoon. Um, we had in March of this year um, a decision from Mr Justice MacDonald um, known as GH, and this was the first of two. There's then a later decision by Mr Justice Holman in May, um, and those are the, the two decisions of particular note in, in this year. And Macdonald J um, reminds himself within the judgment um, of the very serious steps that it is he's being asked to take. Um, and he, as I've said there in the quote that I've given you from the actual judgment, it's a graver step um, still to compel, possibly by means of the use of sedation or force, the removal of a person from their home for attendance at hospital for such medical treatment. Um, so this is really a serious incursion into someone's autonomy and their own decision making. Um, and it's a matter that time and time again, the authorities tell us really should give us um, pause for thought. So just a little bit about um, the GH. Um, GH suffered from depression, anxiety and agoraphobia. Um, to the extent that she hadn't left her home since 2017 and she wanted to have a home birth. Um, she had said previously that she would go to hospital if it was necessary, um, but she had um, her opinions had changed over time in that regard and there was concern on behalf of the treating team that during stressful periods she would in fact revoke that consent and would not want to leave. Um, her capacity had been assessed and the assessor had concluded that she was unable to use and weigh the information about the risks of harm. Um, and therefore the, the court was satisfied in terms of the evidence on capacity, it had to decide best interests. And the pregnancy was assessed, and I've set out the um, extract there from the judgment, as the certain risks that the clinical team had identified were exacerbated um, by a raised level of stress. And we've given you there the various features. Um, so the court had to consider um, GH's best interests um, and balance the risk, um, which it does within the judgment. Um, Mr. Mr. Justice MacDonald um, was very keen to ensure that he'd taken into account the views of um, GH's partner and of her family, and also GH's own um, previous consent to admission um, when she had capacity to so consent before she was overcome by agoraphobia and anxiety. Um, in, this was a case which did come before the court on an out of hours emergency basis, but the court held that it was satisfied that the issues around capacity had only arisen um, very recently, and that in fact when GH had had capacity there hadn't appeared to be any need for an application to the court. So it was within that context that Macdonald J was having to consider it. Um, he was also, of course, taking into account the fact that the recommendation of the official solicitor was that it was in GH's best interest to be admitted to hospital, um, albeit it was against GH's own um, consent. And then we have the postscript, which you do often see in these cases, which um, inform the court and informs the readers of the judgment that um, after the court hearing itself, but before the judgment had been formally handed down, GH had in fact given birth to a healthy baby boy at home um, before it had been possible to put the arrangements into place. So in fact, although the care plan was authorised by the court, it wasn't ultimately needed. 
All right. I just want to touch then on the May, the case for May of this year, which followed on. And that's the decision of Mr. Justice Holman um, in the expectant mother case, as it's known. And again, this was um, another case of agoraphobia. In this case, the circumstances were somewhat different in that it had been possible to plan for the situation because it had been clear that um, she wanted a home birth and there were long-standing concerns that if the need arose, she would not want to be admitted to hospital. So the case was in court approximately two weeks before her actual expected due date, which is perhaps more in line with how the court would like to see things dealt with, although, as I've said, it's not always possible on a practical level. Um, and it was agreed by all parties, including the official solicitor, that there should be authorization of her move to hospital uh, for a pre-planned delivery. That was thought to be in her best interests as a birth plan. And Holman J sets out in the judgment, he's very clear and keen to say that this is not a judgment about the benefits of home birth as opposed to hospital birth. This is um, due to difficulties and a finding in, in effect of a lack of capacity on the part of this mother that she was not thought to be able to agree to travel to hospital, even if that really was required. Um, although it was very clear that, of course, she wanted to be able to give birth to a healthy child and the, the differences um, and the distinction there between the two. Um, Holman Jay went on to endorse, as well as the actual move to hospital, it was interesting, and it, again, these are themes that come through really from the authorities. The trust sought permission to use sedation to help um, the mother to cope with the transfer. Um, now that was the first matter. And then the actual only contentious matter is between the parties in the case was the use of restraint. The official solicitor was opposed to any idea of the use of restraint unless there was an actual emergency. Whereas the trust wanted to be able to use restraint as part of the plan, even for a non-emergency admission. Um, and that was said to be in the form of two people um, using physical, reasonable physical force and restraint to her arms and upper body. And it was set out in, in detail. Um, and the court was satisfied despite the official solicitor's opposition that it was in her best interest for that to happen to ensure that she, um, it was authorized on the basis to get her to the transport and then to be transported from the vehicle at the hospital and into um, the delivery suite. So those are the two areas that were particularly potentially controversial. And again, we have the postscript to the case that she went into spontaneous labour at home and travelled to hospital um, of, her, of her own accord, although it does note in the judgment that there was some reluctance initially, but with her partner and mother and midwife, um, had taken some lorazepam um, to calm her before she embarked upon the transfer, but then allowed herself to be guided to the ambulance. So in effect, um, there was no need for the, certainly not the restraint aspects of the care plan to be given effect. So just by way of conclusion, and I know that has been a very brief outline, but that's where we're um, at in terms of court decisions and the framework around um, this decision making from the court of protections point of view. Planning is key and you see time and time again mentioned in the authorities the need for there to be planning in advance um, and that these emergency out of hours hearings really should only arise um, when it is a true emergency perhaps because um, as we saw in GH the um, capacity issues haven't been so starkly observed um, until the out of hours, in effect, it, it arose quite late. Um, but the, a lack of proper planning will attract some judicial criticism. Um, and we have to be ready for that if we're representing trusts who um, have, for whatever reason, delayed. And there are good reasons for that, as we've already looked at, particularly around P's representation and their voice being heard. So urgent out of hours, although it's there, um, it's to be avoided if at all possible. And when matters do reach the court, um, then provided the court has the proper amount of evidence before it and can see that the guidance has been followed, it moves to a consideration of best interests and a balance of risk. Um, I'll just stop sharing and I can see that something's arisen in the, um, I think in the Q&A, just bear with me one moment. So, yes, thank you, Louise. Louise is just noting, of course, that 
the um, practice direction around serious medical treatment um, was revised in 2017. You do now have the guidance, which I've already referred you to, from Mr Justice Hayden from January of last year, um, which gives us the practice guidance. Um, and I think I gave you the citation for that on the slides, um, which talks about the procedure to be followed where a decision relating to medical treatment arises um, and for thought to be given to applications to the Court of Protection. Right, I don't think we've got anything else in the chat. So unless there's anything else, I will hand over, I think, at this point to Maria. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, that was really interesting. Um, thank you for that. Um, can you, right, I'm just going to try and share my screen. So bear with me one second. Um, Can everybody see that? Fantastic. Okay, so um, as Jackie said, my name is Maria Booker and I'm Programmes Director of um, the charity Birth Rights. So if anybody's not heard of Birth Rights, we're a charity that aims to improve maternity care through a focus on human rights. And I like to use this quote from an American birth activist called January Harsh, because I think it sums up our philosophy really well. It says, I do not care what kind of birth you have, a home birth, scheduled caesarean, epidural hospital birth, or if you birth alone in the woods next to baby deer. I care that you had options, that you were supported in your choices, and that you were respected. So at Birthright, that's what we're all about. We don't push any particular form of birth. We're not advocating for home birth or caesarean birth or anything else. We just want people to be able to make the choices that are right for them and to be supported in those choices which is obviously challenging in, in the uh, case of, of women whose cases come before the court protection. But I'll talk a little bit more about our observations of those cases. Um, but just to explain a bit more about what we do as a charity. So we have an advice service um, and that's open to any uh, woman or birthing person who is experiencing maternity care. Um, they can come to us if they have any questions about having their choices respected, for example, or if they want to make a complaint about their care, if they don't feel they were treated respectfully um, or, or anything else to do with human rights and maternity care. And the advice line is also open to healthcare professionals. So uh, a number of healthcare professionals contact us to ask about questions that are coming up in their practice too, to ask how, how the law applies in the circumstance that's before them. So that's our advice line. We also um, run training sessions for healthcare professionals. So. We train over a thousand healthcare professionals each year. That's normally by going to trust, um, but we also train groups of peer supporters as well. And we, uh, we take what we learn from the advice service and also from our work with healthcare professionals. And that informs all of our research and campaigns and policy work that we do. Uh, so at the moment, one of the key pieces of work we're doing is an inquiry into racial injustice. So we're looking at why um, black women are um, four times more likely to die around um, the period of childbirth. Um, Asian women twice as likely to die and women from mixed ethnic backgrounds three times more likely to die than white women and really centering their experience. Um, the inquiry is run by a QC and also chaired by um, a healthcare professional um, and a service user jointly together. Um, so that's a bit of a summary of, of what we do as an organisation. Um, I thought it might be helpful, so I know I normally speak to healthcare professionals, so it's um, a novelty for me to speak to, to a group of, of lawyers, but um, I'm conscious that what happens in the court of protection doesn't happen in a vacuum, and I thought it might be helpful just to pick up some of the key themes that uh, have happened in maternity care over the last few years. Um, so. I'm going to take you back to 2016 when there was a national maternity review. It was chaired by Baroness Cumberledge and the outcome of that review was a report called Better Births. And um, Better Births, in many of the recommendations there were not new, but uh, they reiterated that there should be a focus on giving women choice, particularly around choice of place of birth. Um, they really emphasised the importance of continuity of care. 
Uh, so that, that was seen as a really exciting opportunity. Somebody once said that continuity of care, um, if it was a pill, it would be negligent not to prescribe it because there's so much good evidence for how it helps uh, with reducing stillbirth and reducing premature birth and reducing the need for pain relief um, and improving outcomes generally. Uh, and though at around the same time of better birth, there's also um, a national ambition launched to halve the rate of stillbirth and neonatal deaths by uh, 2025. Um, so the, the vision of better birth was for both safe and personalised care. And those things were talked about as being two sides of the uh, same coin. Um, so th th that's been the focus of maternity services for the last five years through the Maternity Transformation Programme. But over that time, there's also been um, a number of reports um, and scandals. I'm sure most of you will have heard of many of them. So we had um, Morecambe Bay, that was just before the period of better births. But since then, we've had um, the inquiry into Shrewsbury and Telford and the interim uh, Ockenden report that published last December. Uh, we've also had um, the first um, criminal prosecution by the CQC of an NHS trust in terms of East Kent over um, Harry Richford's death and the clinical care around that. And there's been another a number of other inquiries, for example, South Wales and, and Nottingham more recently. Uh, so there's this, this feeling of kind of scrutiny um, of maternity services and feeling that although there's uh, this programme to improve maternity services, at the same time, there's this unearthing of, um, of kind of poor care. And some of the themes in those reports are very similar about needing enough staff to deliver good care, about multidisciplinary working, particularly between midwives and doctors, um, and about listening to women. So that's, um, you know, a theme about the, these reports and these scandals. The, the other theme over this period, I would say, is um, an increased focus on inequalities and that not everybody experiences the same outcomes and that outcomes are particularly bad for um, black and brown women, but also um, for you know, women at severe, at risk of severe and multiple disadvantage as well. Um, and then of course we had COVID and I think a, a, an emergency like that always shines a light on what's important to um, an organization or a service. And I think what we saw in COVID was um, perhaps a lack of depth to the, the maternity transformation program. So um, although some trusts really hung on to their continuity of care and models and really used them to make sure that they were keeping in touch with the women they were looking after um, and really wanted to continue to offer things like home birth and midwifery led services, because in fact, that's what many women were wanting at that time, given the messages to stay at home many services went the other way and kind of centralised their staff and, and got rid of those uh, midwifery-led services which caused staff to be out in the community. And in, in some of those cases there were very good reasons for that and it's hard to see how anybody could have done anything different, but certainly in some cases that seems to have been done very preemptively. Um, and the other thing about COVID was um, perhaps a lack of focus on the importance of support so we had um, a number of cases where women gave birth on their own uh, and more generally um, visiting was really restricted for some time. And I think now the um, health and safe care and safety investigation branch reports have revealed that there were some unintended consequences there, which perhaps should have been foreseen. So, for example, interpreters, um, or women lost access to interpretation, although it isn't the case that that healthcare professionals should rely on family members to interpret, that's not an ideal situation at all. In reality, that is what happens and in, in many cases, particularly in labour. Um, and so where partners were excluded, um, women who were kind of more vulnerable from not having English as a first language, lost the ability to say what they wanted and advocate for themselves. Um, and some women who died, their families also talk about the, the fact that they felt that they should have been there to advocate for them, that things might have been different. We also know that people made different decisions because of the visiting restrictions in place. So people um, delayed going into hospital or delayed seeking care um, or discharged themselves early um, because 
there wasn't a kind of thinking through of the consequences of that of that action. So in terms of where we are now, uh, the Health um, and Social Care Committee in Parliament has just published um, a report into the safety of maternity services and they established an expert panel to feed back on how the government had done over the last five years in meeting some of the commitments it had made. Um, and the report, I have to say, doesn't make a uh, brilliant reading. So you can see from this table that the expert panel felt there were some areas of improvement, particularly around stillbirth and neonatal death, so particularly the safety side and um, the focus on, on saving babies' lives. But in, in most other areas, uh, they were rated inadequate, uh, particularly around their commitments to make care more personalised, um, to make sure continuity of care and models were in place, and to make sure that staffing was safe. Um, and all, while the, the pandemic seems to be moving into a new phase, and I think most of us feel that the life has returned to normal somewhat, um, in maternity services, uh, it feels like this isn't really the case. So um, there's a big issue with uh, low vaccination levels amongst pregnant women, with still a minority of pregnant women um, having been vaccinated, which means that although overall um, hospital hospitalizations relating to COVID have come down, uh, actually a larger proportion, a much larger proportion of those people in critical care in hospitals are unvaccinated pregnant women. And in addition to that, while there's been staffing shortages and staffing issues throughout the pandemic, uh, there is a particularly acute shortage of um, staff now. So uh, a, an NHS digital report said recently that 300 midwives have left um, over the period from May to June or July. Um, and that's what we're hearing from services all the time, that people are kind of have reached their limit, they're burnt out, people are leaving to go to other professions or retiring, um, midwives from Europe obviously can't come back. Uh, so although it feels like in, in many areas of life um, COVID is over, I think it's uh, important to know that it doesn't feel like that in maternity services. And then so the prospect of realising some of this increased personalisation um, look a little bit bleak at the moment. Um, this has been backed up in our own research. So uh, last year was the fifth anniversary of the Montgomery versus Lanarkshire decision. Um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with that, that um, Supreme Court judgment. We're very lucky to have Nadine Montgomery as our patron at Birthrights. Um, and we did a survey last year with Mumsnet to look at how far that decision had been implemented in practice. So obviously Montgomery this is Lanarkshire confirms that it's the patient who's the decision maker and the healthcare professional who is there to facilitate that person to make an informed choice. Um, but the, the survey we did found that less than half of the people surveyed felt that that was the case. They less than half felt that they were the primary decision maker in their care. Uh, and again, this is uh, echoed in research that's been done recently. Um, this. Uh, these points were taken from a qualitative study or an ethnographic study done by a team at UCL um, who looked at um, a, sm a small group of women going through maternity care and uh, analysed and observed their antenatal appointments and these conversations that they were having during their antenatal care um, to try and understand how much Montgomery versus Lanarkshire had made a difference. And what they found was that there's still a culture of expected compliance in maternity care. So rather than women and birthing people experiencing that it's their choice. Um, there's a little bit of room for manoeuvre, but people are generally feel like they're expected to go along with what's recommended. Um, they also found that the relationship between uh, the midwife and doctor and the, the woman, the pregnant woman, was particularly important, just as important as the information themselves. So if that woman really trusted the healthcare professional they were talking to, uh, they would perhaps not ask so many questions, they'd be happier to go along with recommendations. Um, there was a lot of faith put in the relationship as well. They also found that there was um, a dominance of cl clinical framing of these decisions um, and that that was how the appointment was framed and focused. Um, whereas for women, there were social factors that were just as important. So, for example, who was going to be present at, at their birth if they made a certain decision or 
or where the birth is going to take place um, or the timing of the birth. Um, and so there's a question really about how in maternity care in general, we start to make more room for what women feel is important um, and that that's not just a clinical consideration. So why am I sharing all of this with you? Um, I think it's just important to note that these decisions don't take, take place in a vacuum. And I think that if the landscape of maternity care um, or the culture of maternity care was perhaps more in line than the, with the policy and legal uh, realities, then that, that would feed through to court protection decisions as well. So what we know at Birthrights is that there's two things that really um, make for a positive birth experience, and that's a, uh, a good relationship with your care team and feeling in control of decisions. And that's um, backed up by um, a, a really substantial body of evidence that shows that both ways, that if you don't have control and you don't have a good relationship, then that's likely to re lead to trauma. Um, and uh, the opposite is also true. If you have a good relationship and you feel in control, then it doesn't really matter how your birth unfolds. And that, that can be a surprise to some people. It doesn't matter if you were wanting a vaginal birth and ended up with an emergency cesarean or, or the other way around or anything else, as long as those two factors were, were present. And of course, this is uh, extremely challenging um, in the context of the Court of Protection. You think that the, the evidence shows that it's sort of automatically a recipe for trauma if you're going to take away people's choice. So I think um, what we're really interested in as a charity is how uh, the maternity experience of this particular group can be um, improved. Um, so what, what I'm going to offer is some observations um, coming out of some of the recent Court of Protection cases. Um, I don't pretend to be a, an expert at all um, and I'm really interested to hear, hear the views of, of people in the audience who are um, more closely connected to these cases and, and particularly to hear from Kevin as well about the experience of medical professionals. They're definitely very difficult decisions um, but you know these are some factors that we've, we've picked up from the cases that have been before the court recently. I think the first thing to say is that it's quite difficult to make um, some informed uh, assessment of what is going on in the court protection because of the fact that um, you can only go on the final published rulings. Um, and even if you have the, the judgment before you, there's no sight of the arguments made in court for, for good reason. But um, that does uh, limit um, the accessibility of, of uh, understanding the processes and what could be improved. Um, in the absence of uh, observing a, a ruling yourself, uh, a lot of the maternity community find out about these cases through um, what's published in the press. And again, that's a double edged sword. Some of that um, can be good. It raises awareness of these sorts of cases and some of the issues um, involved. But on the other hand, some of the write ups can be quite superficial or even sensational, um, which doesn't always um, help us make progress in this area either. Uh, we're really grateful to the Open Justice Court of Protection project. You've done a lot of work to try and improve the transparency of the court of protection. So they encourage people to observe hearings um, and they ask them to write them up as a blog so that more people can understand what it's like to be in a court of protection hearing and um, what goes on in practice, which can only be a, a good thing. I think another, another missing point of the piece of the jigsaw is that there's a lack of follow up or research um, of the long term impact on these decisions on the women affected. And although that there's some very practical issues about doing that kind of research, it would be fantastic to have better information about how these women are affected in the longer term by their experience. So the first issue that um, that strikes us looking at these cases is that um, there's a conflation sometimes of capacity and somebody making an unwise decision. So in perhaps the most recent case um, before uh, the court regarding um, birth, which was about a woman who was refusing blood products, um, the official solicitor in this quote observes that the, the woman concerned is considered capacitous by her treating clinicians in all the areas in which she's willing to take the medical advice. It's only where she is not willing to follow medical advice that she's considered to lack capacity. Um, and I think that's um, 
been shown in other cases too for example in the Miss A case in, in February this year where um, Miss A had paranoid schizophrenia um, she was found to be unable to weigh up the risks and benefits of a um, external cephalic version to, to turn her breech baby when she was declining the um, external cephalic version but a week later when she said yes to it uh, her capacity wasn't questioned so, um, and this was noted in Sam Halliday's book in 2016. Sam's done a lot of work in this area about court protection um, hearings and cases. So I, I think that's um, a matter of con concern of the um, capacity should be assessed on the basis of whether women have it or not in the face of a particular decision, but not on the basis of the particular choice that they're making. Um, and, Another um, sort of potential issue of concern is that the capacity assessment is often taken at face value, even though research shows that doctors often lack, capacity, lack confidence in, in carrying out those assessments. And that the, the most senior consultants, who are often the people called when there's a, a tricky situation um, fa facing a more junior doctor, um, are, are the least confident in carrying out those assessments. And um, Penn's research showed that fewer than half the doctors who participated um, had, had received training in mental capacity legislation, which means that there's a substantial variation in practice about how these capacity assessments are carried out. And I think there's a question about whether the courts are aware of that and whether more could be done to create a um, peer support network amongst clinicians to um, ensure people who have more experience of the assessments can help those who have, have less experience. Uh, Jackie's already talked about the issue of the timing of bringing cases um, and referred to the guidance that says that courts should ideally be brought as early as possible and no later than four weeks before the expected due date. Um, and, and many, uh, as Jackie recognised, many cases don't meet that guidance and there can be a number of reasons for, for that, as, as Jackie alluded to. So sometimes the, um, the capacity issue doesn't um, show itself until quite late in the day. Uh, sometimes women are late booking into care and have intermittent engagements with um, antenatal care, which makes it difficult to assess what capacity is like. Um, sometimes there's poor communication between a mental health trust and a, um, an, an H, a maternity service um, involved in somebody's care. Um, and the result of that is that there's a lack of medical records, um, there's a lack of independent expert witnesses, um, and a lack of time for the official solicitor to play their role in terms of engaging with, um, with the woman and also her family. I think it's also important to point out that the role of the official solicitor is not actually to represent the woman, it's to represent her best interests. And I think our concern is that um, nobody's explicitly representing in the course at the moment what the woman wants, even when she's expressed a view um, previously. Um, advanced decisions are an interesting um, tool here that aren't much used in maternity cases. Um, and whether even just going through the discussion around an advanced decision where somebody might have to be more specific about the uh, situations in which they would contemplate making a different decision would help healthcare professionals and lawyers and judges to have a better view of, of what the woman's thoughts and views and you know, preferences are. Um, but even when women do express a view, it, it rarely seems to have an impact on the outcome. And this uh, quote is taken from the Miss A case. It says, I'm in no doubt that the views expressed by Miss A are not in her best interest. Um, so there's a concern here about who, who's missing from the room, whether the woman's voice is adequately represented in court of protection hearings. And then we get on to, in the absence of that, how is how are best interests determined? Um, and there, seems to be an interesting kind of rationale around how that is uh, how that decision is is reached so you know quite often it goes something like well hospital must be uh, safer than home um, a cesarean section would avoid any uncertainty over the woman not co cooperating or having to make more decisions during labor for example whether to have an instrumental birth or a cesarean if things were not going to plan and therefore it's just easier to, to have a cesarean section 
Um, and I think there's something about judicial risk aversion there as well. I, no, but no woman wants to have um, a catastrophic outcome from their baby, but they they they're still allowed to, you know, they're still able to um, decide what risk they are able to tolerate. And whereas in the court of protection, uh, it sort of almost seems inevitable that the best interest will be determined as a as a cesarean section. Um, so yeah. It, just interesting to consider whether that is actually always in, in somebody's best interests um, and whether that's driven by this biomedical conception of, of birth um, and having to avoid that very small risk in, in most cases of avoiding a catastrophic outcome um, and conflating the fact that, that women say that they want the best outcome to their baby with, with not being able to tolerate any, any risk um, around the, the risk to the baby at all. There's often a lack of clarity around who the risk accrues to, but in some cases there's actually an explicit mention of the fact that it's we're talking about a risk of the fetus, even though the court is there to assess um, the best interests of the woman. Um, the risks of vaginal birth are often um, spelt out, whereas those of cesarean section are skated over. And it's, it's interesting to note that that's um, in direct um, conflict to what we see in other areas of our work. We've done a maternal request cesarean campaign before because the, the NICE guidance says that if women want to choose a cesarean, even if there's no clinical indication, if they're making an informed choice, then they should be offered one. And women who go down that path often have appointment after appointment where the risk of a cesarean are spelt out. Um, whereas in, in court protection cases, the, the opposite seems to be true. And then finally, it's worth noting that despite often in these cases saying that a cesarean might be the only safe way to deliver a baby um, it often turns out that that women do have a vaginal birth um, and it seems to be okay um, so it, are we learning from experience with that feeding back into these decisions and um, finally I think we think uh, a concern is that the impact of the court's decisions are not always considered in particular whether safe restraints is possible. Um, talking to a colleague in another charity who, who used to work um, as a, a mental health nurse, he said, you know, the availability of people who are trained in safe restraint is, uh, is scarce. And, uh, you know, whether you can safely restrain, restrain a pregnant woman or a woman who's just given birth is, um, is questionable, but, but that seems to be something that's, that's not often explored in these cases. And then there are obviously the psychological and relational risks and harms of, of somebody who's already vulnerable, um, going through forced surgery, sedation um, and restraints. And, um, you know, judges often mention that they don't take those decisions lightly, and I'm sure that they don't. But uh, there are unquestionably um, knock on impacts for that woman going forward. Uh, you can imagine somebody who's um, been through that experience and how they're likely to relate to health services in the future and what that might mean for them personally. Um, you know, that's, that's a really serious consideration. And often um, these, court, these court cases are combined with a situation where the newborn is, is going to be taken into social care, which is also a huge um, impact on, on the women concerned. And we don't see, uh, support plans being discussed very often around those decisions. So where do we go from here? What, what, what are the sort of solutions to some of these issues? So um, some of the avenues for exploration, I'd be really interested to hear what people think of them. Um, are that antenatally, I think we need a greater focus on more support for, for women and birthing people and building those relationships to trust that we know make for um, a more positive birth experience. I think there's a, an opportunity to explore advanced decisions as a tool that's not often used that, that could add uh, something to the armory of tools in, in these cases. Um, I think there's a, a recognised need for national guidance. We've, we've had the guidance from Justice Hayden, which is very helpful, but guidance from the Royal Colleges um, and training for clinicians who have to recognise and deal with these cases. Um, and 
more work can be done to ensure that uh, applications go to court earlier when that is that is possible. And in terms of in, in court itself and in preparation for the court, it would be good to see proper representation of an individual's voice um, and also more recognition of the trauma, um, including historic trauma and trauma inherent in these court processes and in, in mandated surgery and restraints, etc. Um, as part of the decision making process. We're also really keen that the court has access to a full range of expert witnesses, including midwifery witnesses, which are uh, more common nowadays, but not always called upon um, where perhaps they could be. Um, and in general, I think there's room for improved knowledge and understanding about um, birth and what are safe choices in, uh, for, for capac capacitors women and these, the decisions that people make every day about their birth um, so that you know, judges and legal practitioners can understand better the context in which these decisions should be made. So I hope that's helpful. Um, I just wanted to say a, a quick plug for the fact that Birthright is looking to recruit um, some more legal trainers at the end of this year. Um, and it would be fantastic to have some um, lawyers who had uh, experience of court of protection cases as, as part of that, that intake. So if anybody is interested in that opportunity, please do drop me an email and we can let you know when the recruitment round starts. But I hope that's helpful and, and thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing more from Kevin. Hello, can you hear me? I've had a few technical IT issues during that presentation, Maria, and so I've missed a little bit of it as I shot to my iPad and here, there, and everywhere. So I'm going to try and share my screen if I can. Um, so hopefully. I managed to just get an email at the wrong time. It's got to go out of the way before I can right, share. Okay. I don't know what that document recovery claim is, but it should go up as a, from the beginning there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, sorry, but can everybody see my screen now? Yep, so sorry about that uh, little technical difficulties. I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist at Holland East Yorkshire, as uh, Jacqueline and, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the real difficulties that we can have um, when we're faced with problems uh, on labelled late at night, uh, when sometimes decisions, which you've heard about already today, are best made before the events happen. Um, so, you also know about, you all should be aware of what uh, the definition of capacity is, so I don't intend to go through this, but I think it's worth us just reminding ourselves about capacity, um, and in particular for medical, for the medical practitioners, we have the ability to do things to to patients which we feel are is in their best interest um, at that particular time when we can't necessarily get any other um, guidance to what we need to do. But that isn't always quite straightforward and quite so easy to do when you're faced with a big problem at night. So I'm gonna take you through a few case scenarios and I'm more than happy for you to put something into the Q&A, or even if you want to do that at the end, that's fine. But say we have a 25-year-old woman having her first baby, 36 weeks pregnant. That seems completely reasonable at that stage. Quite a common occurrence that happens. But we see that she's a breech presentation. So what do we do? Well, the normal thing for a lady having her first baby at that stage would be to offer a ECV, so ex external cavallic version to try and turn the baby around from breach to head first, which is 
a safer position for the baby to be delivered in. But she doesn't want that to happen and she doesn't want any operations and we, she doesn't want an ECV. Um, but she has got a history of learning difficulties. So what we've done in the past to try and come to try and come to some sort of conclusion of the best way of managing um, this lady at this stage, given the past history. Um, and I would say that really what should have been done is what really we should be thinking about here. So we should look at the case notes and we should see whether there's been some discussion previously about what is in her best interests and we should have had that discussion well in time of this problem occurring at that stage. So hopefully if we've done as we have been told already by Jacqueline and by Maria, we will have gone through the whole process and we'll have worked out the best interests. If need be, we will have invoked uh, court action, but most of the time by discussion, we should have been a um, discussion with her or her relatives, their IMPCA, um, IMPCA's the patient advocate, um, birthright if need be, we should have come to some sort of conclusion of what to do if this lady doesn't want or feels she hasn't got the capacity to tell us what she wants to do at that stage, we should have already been worried. The only thing that I would be worried about here, and I'm going to go back, 25-year-old um, woman having their first baby, history of learning difficulties, and we're going into, we're wondering what we are doing with an operation or what happens in labour. Did anybody think about the safeguarding issues of how did she end up being pregnant to begin with? You know, was that a consensual sexual act or was it not? You know, so there might be something that's out with this, perhaps out with this talk for you to, to think about. So it's not, so as doctors, we're not always faced with thinking about what we have to do at the time. It's actually, you know, how do we get into this situation in the first place? Is there something else we should have been thinking about? Okay, so I'll throw that out just as your, uh, just as something to help you go through. Um, case scenario two, 37 year old woman, um, second baby diagnosed, this is sort of two o'clock in the morning or Saturday morning, nobody's around, um, difficult even to get another doctor, uh, but has arrived in the hospital in labour, we know from some bloods we've done just as she arrived in the hospital, because she said she'd been bruised a bit, that she has this horrendous hematological disorder, which can lead to severe bleeding when we do an operation. And that could lead to the baby's, to the baby dying. Oh, to, sorry, to the mother dying. Um, so she's in early labour. The baby's now in distress. Under normal circumstances, you might proceed to a cesarean section to help the, help deliver the baby safely. Um, but you equally well know that by doing that, you might end up with the, the mother herself dying. Now, the mother at that stage insists on doing the best for her baby. So my question, a little bit from the comes from this is, is she making a rational decision? Is she making a, a decision that's uh, in her best interest? Um, well, it's probably not in her best interest to have a cesarean section because she might die from it, um, but it is probably in the best interest of a baby. So who has the legal right here? Is it, is it the mother? Is it the baby? Well, the baby's not born. So by definition, the baby in the, in England at least, does not have the uh, right to life that the mother has. And we might kill her by doing a cesarean section. Now, we also learned she has a two-year-old at home who's, and she's a single mother, and her parents have arrived on labor ward and said, well, I don't want her to die. So that's against what she's saying, potentially. Um, so, that is a, a dilemma. So what does the doctor do in that circumstance? 
what is the best thing to do. Um, and you've also got to remember here that if we go ahead and do a cesarean section, we might end up with a normal healthy baby. We might end up with a dead mother. Um, what effect does that have on the rest of the staff that are sitting there, on the doctors who's actually doing the cesarean section, or on the midwives who are who are there, on the neonatal staff, on the scrub staff, or whatever? There's a whole load of other people around this. What happens to her parents who didn't want her to die? And we've done an operation that potentially could that could happen. So we're faced with this real dilemma. So I would be interested to hear what people think a little bit on the Q&A um, of what happens when you're faced with this dilemma at two o'clock on a Saturday morning and it's really difficult to know what to do. Um, if you go ahead with one course of action, it will not be their best interest, but, it might, but she wants you to do that. Um, and she's, there's no reason to think she hasn't got capacity. Um, but is the very fact of her being a mother wanted to do the best for a baby and knowing does that do anything to her capacity? And I can tell you now, uh, fetal distress at this stage, you haven't got a lot of time. Otherwise, you'll end up with the baby also being severely brain damaged. So it's, a, it's not a straightforward situation. Um, did somebody send a Q, something on Q and A then, Jackie, or chat? No, I'm, no, I was just double checking to see if there was anything new. And then just my screen and, shot and, down. And, and everyone's just being remarkably quiet on the chat as well. So I was just double checking to see if there was anything there. Well, then maybe they're having to think about this. <laughs> Hopefully, when they, when we're in the middle of nowhere. So. I'm going to give you a scenario three, and then hopefully we're going to have a little bit of time to, to work out the best way of dealing with these. 30 year old, first baby, all seems fine, presented in labor, prior to that had no problems whatsoever. Um, see, I've got a question uh, in the chat, uh, it says, not this is the case before not sure i'm thinking of doing the best for both well the problem is i don't know what the best for both is the best for the baby is definitely delivering the, the mother the best for the mother is probably not delivering uh, so it's a it's a real difficult dilemma um this might be a, this scenario might be a little bit easier uh, term term meaning she's nearly 40 weeks she's due the due date's there no problems previously that we know about. We're going to, well, there are some problems, but I'm going to talk to talk to you about those. Early labour, the CTG, that's a baby's heart trace, suggests some fetal distress. I don't know why I've spoke fetal like that. Um, there's meconium glycol, which means that the baby's pooed in their um, waters before, and which, if it's thick, is quite often a sign of some distress. We've also tried to do a blood sample from the baby's head to get its a bit better idea of how well the baby is, but we failed to get that. So we've now faced with a situation where our normal movement would be cesarean section. Um, I'm trying to press my button, nothing seems to be happening. Ah. However, we learn that the lady has bipolar disorder. Oh, she's refusing the cesarean section. That's what I was trying to tell you. So our normal thing would have been that, but we learned she has bipolar disorder. And I know there's been a case written up in one of the medical journals this year uh, about what uh, trust and bipolar disorder for very similar things, but she's on medication and she's known to the uh, psychiatric service. And while she's on medication, they're completely happy that she functions normally and there's no reason why she could not make normal decisions. So that's my question. Did we know about this in the past? What did we gain from that in the past? Um, and was there an antenatal plan? Well, the antenatal plan said, yeah, 
we have no problems with her, her capacity is fine, that she can make decisions. So she's refused a cesarean section. So on that note, we would normally say, well, actually, you've got to respect the mother's wishes. Um, she knows it's a bit like the ladies who were at home who wouldn't come into hospital. It, you know, she she's the one who's got to make the decision. And, and unfortunately, we just have to take it on the head about the baby. If the baby dies, well, that's it's her decision. Um, and we we should respect that. However, we suddenly learn that she's actually not been taking the medication recently. So, um, so we know she's got this disorder, but we know she's okay on medication. But then we find out that actually she hasn't been taking this medication. And her family at that stage come in and say, well, actually she's goes like this when she doesn't take a medication she's irrational doesn't make proper decisions doesn't know what she's doing she could walk out in the road and stand in front of a bus they expect the bus to stop all these things could happen so how what are you going to do at that stage given that there's a time frame with fetal distress uh, we would normally be looking at the cesarean section within 30 minutes of that sort of scenario to give the baby the best chance. So that's something we call a grade one cesarean section. Um, and now we're faced with this situation where we might not be able to do that. What do we do? Do we, well, the trust has a lawyer on, on standby, so we phone them up. Um, doesn't matter what time of the day it is, so 24 hours a day, we phone them up. They have, they need a little bit of thinking time. By the time somebody's thought of phoning the lawyer up, 10 minutes of fetal distress has passed. Now we're, they're thinking about this, another 10 minutes has passed. Preparation for a cesarean section takes a little bit of time. You can't just immediately do it. So um, even if they say, well, go ahead against her wishes to do a cesarean section, it might still be 45, 50 minutes we've been stuck there making a decision. So I'm going to leave that open to you to, to think about the practicalities of this. Um, and I hope that those three scenarios have kind of demonstrated sometimes we're not in the best position to make decisions. And sometimes we might be making decisions which in hindsight or at a later date, we might have made differently. But actually, everybody is under a lot of pressure to, to come up with the right thing to do at that particular time. And it isn't, there isn't always, in, especially in obstetrics, there isn't always very much time to make your decisions. So in summary to my little part here, I think some pre-discussion -dis helps. So where you know, even if you knew about the lady having bipolar disorder, uh, that last case, there is a particular time when you might have, you should have had that pre-discussion um, and established the rules around capacity um, and talked through that with the relatives or the close contacts. So you've made a plan that, that should she not have the medication for a while, at least we've had a little thinking ahead of the event about what we're supposed to do. We've, we've perhaps talked to um, our legal representatives, or even the court, if need be, but we've we've kind of preempted this position if we can. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. Um, yet Maria may have talked about this while I was having all my difficulties with uh, IT, but using it, IMCA, which is the for. A, the medical staff will quite often use that so as an independent patient advocate. Um, they're independent of the relatives or of the um, partner or whatever, but they're kind of specially trained in that and they'll give you a little bit of help. But ultimately, as doctors, we still have the, we can still do something at that time, but we might use them because we might, they might suggest that we speak to the trust legal team or um, beyond that, the court of 
court of protection as well. So it isn't always so straightforward, but they may give us some indicator to say, well, actually, this is the right thing to do for that particular patient at that particular time. Um, as I said earlier on, we've also got to think, is there maybe some safeguarding issue here? And, that, and I think for the first case, not only was the case itself had its problems, but actually you might want to start to think about, you know, how did a 25-year-old woman who, has, who apparently hasn't got capacity even get pregnant in the first place, was there, was there a safeguarding issue there? So, so I think we've got to think about that. And then, then just the rights of everybody around. And it, it's really difficult. To, it's difficult enough when you're a medic and you've seen somebody, uh, you know, I think as a medical student, and this has probably drew me to obstetrics or it could have sent me the other way. But as a medical student, I, I saw a woman come in quite healthy with her partner, had a baby and then had a fit after, after immediately after she delivered um, and actually then had a ruptured blood vessel inside her head and ended up dying. And, it, you know, I didn't, as a medical student, you kind of see this happening and you get shifted to the side. You didn't really think too much about it. You thought about the condition. But what made me really think about that was about two weeks later, I saw the father taking the baby home. And I thought, what a terrible situation. He's now taking the baby home, but without his wife. So this must be, you know, I couldn't really comprehend how difficult that situation might be. So I think there are always kind of pre-experiences um, which we all go through that make us sort of come to conclusions, but actually it doesn't always help you in the situation of trying to decide things in a hurry for the best interest of that particular person. Um, so we've got some chat possibilities. So I can stop sharing my screen. Um, so urgent assessment of capacity. Incas don't work at weekends. Apologies, I didn't read Impica right. So, Jack, do you want to say anything? Yeah, okay. So just going back to that urgent assessment of capacity, I think that was um, a point that Rachel was making in terms of um, your last scenario um, and what you do at the point when you realise and you're told that she's not been taking a medication. Um, so that may well have impacted upon capacity. And what struck me really in terms of that is that, and this is why it's so useful sometimes to actually hear the perspective from on the ground, because when time's against you like that, um, obviously an, ass an assessment of capacity is going to take a little bit longer. The points made in some of the recent case law, the applications to the court, even on an urgent out of hours basis, they take time to set up. Yeah. Um, you know, the minutes are ticking by. Um, and although we might feel that we're doing things as fast as we can, obviously the, 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 um, decision making you're dealing with is very immediate isn't it so I mean what's from your point of view in terms of getting assessments of capacity on that sort of urgent basis in the middle of the night how just how feasible is that it's virtually impossible so what we would tend to do is we would tend to look for a colleague who's there or who can help us out and um, we've got slightly better chance of of maybe finding one of our colleagues. Um, in the trust I work in, there are, there's a gynecologist on call as well as an obstetrician. Sometimes the obstetrician has already, um, so they will have had training in, even if they've not done obstetrics recently, they will have had training obstetrically. So it's sometimes just kind of phone a friend and get somebody there to help you make the decisions when time's against you. Um, you might pick up the phone to the trust lawyer and say look I'm going to have to make this decision but ultimately um, our training would be that actually we do what is in the best in what we feel is in the best interest of the patient at the time so you know and and then we sometimes just have to pick pieces up at, at the end yeah yeah because you've reached but that life death type decision yeah. 
because we, you know, it, or maybe this in distress, we just haven't got very much time to make decisions. So, you know, half an hour for that baby could mean the difference between it being alive or dead or being brain damaged and not. You know, you can't, it's unfortunate, just as there isn't time to, to make those decisions. Yeah. And I suppose, um, I don't know what Maria would think about this as well, but um, that kind of highlights, doesn't it, the, the difficulty in making those decisions when it actually comes to it on the yeah. labour ward or on the, in the delivery suite. Whereas if there is scope for some pre-planning discussions, as I think you said, around yeah. this woman's diagnosis and what's happening with her, actually, before you get to that stage, it's got to come back to the planning, hasn't it? Well, it has. Um, unfortunately, it isn't well it should be planned and we should be thinking about that but you know as Maria has talked about in her talk sometimes people who uh sometimes where capacity is fluctuating in they don't attend antidote clerks they, they, they don't they just don't appear so you may find out about things at a very late stage um, but if you can have some pre-planning that's quite useful well yeah. that's very useful yeah, and we've just had another um, comment in the chats from Louise that in terms of advanced decision making, which is something I know Maria had a particular view about and thought that that would be yeah. helpful. Um, and, and I think Louise again has just said it's got very little take up by patients. Is that something, Kevin, that you feel in terms of advanced decision making might assist if you can engage and uh, hear what you're saying about difficulties with engaging sometimes? Um, with the patient but to get their advanced decision absolutely so you know I, where it's really difficult and and it is difficult for midwives they've got about and this they've got about 100 things to try and sort out at you know when you first see them and you're probably seeing a um a woman at that stage when they're quite excited about being pregnant and to actually go through planning out things and even, and the time frame is short. So you have to really think, you know, do I include an extra visit for that person? Or do I try and go through this and make some advanced planning? Uh, and it just, it's it's sometimes quite difficult to do that just from a practical point of view. Yeah. Um, but it is the right thing to do, but it just isn't always as easy. <laughs> As it no. as saying it, that's the trouble. Maria, is there anything that you've come across in terms of practice that um, you might want to think about there in, in terms of improving that patient take up? As, as Louise says, they, they do promote it, but it's it's very low. It is. Oh, that's really interesting to hear. I mean, I, I think that continuity of care has a really important part to play um, mm -hmm. here, particularly from specialist midwives and people who've got um, you know, history of mental illness when we did our work on holding it all together with birth companions, looking at the maternity experience of women facing severe and multiple disadvantage, you know, they, they were really crucial in kind of nav helping people to navigate the system and understanding why somebody might not be engaging and following up with them. And, and knowing perhaps, you know, if you've known them throughout their pregnancy, and I know that's an ideal scenario, but, you know, if you've had some contact, then, I think maybe you can pick up earlier if there are changes in someone's behaviour and they don't seem to be taking their medication before we get to the labour stage or you can have those conversations about how important it is to keep up that medication right until the point of birth and um, I think it's about relationships and you know that's what really helps at the end of the day I think but I you know I completely understand that there are practical difficulties not least in just having the resources to do that but I think you know if, if it comes to it, if those decisions are really hard. In fact, if you want somebody who's going to tell you with confidence that they know that, that woman definitely did want to put the baby first or, you know, and they were saying that throughout their pregnancy and you want to have confidence that that person knew them and knows that's their, their view. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, that, it, it's interesting that you said that about resource, Maria. I think that's probably where we have our biggest difficulty in medicine at the minute. You know, to have proper continuity of care, you need a, a, a reasonable number of midwives because you can't expect a, a midwife to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In, you know, it just doesn't happen like that. So, and most places have just not got enough 
midwives um, to go around. And actually, they're quite limited in the amount of time they've got to spend with a woman, even if it's continuity of care. But that is at least a helpful thing. It, they're not kind of going through the same getting to know the patient. And the patient has a little bit more confidence in them. So the same small group of midwives definitely helps that. Um, unfortunately, that's kind of the data that hasn't been really looked at. It's been looked at, you know, the nice, healthy woman will have no particular problems. But actually, the groups that probably benefit most from continuity of care are those in a more difficult situation. And that's the bit that we need to, to look at in research and show that that's actually where we need to put our resources. I mean, I think we all know that, just people yeah. don't. Yeah. People that have, the, actually, have the cash don't know, uh, don't yeah. want to know it. It's, a, it's, I mean, it's really challenging on the, on the um, you know, staff and resources front, but I think a lot of trusts that do have limited resources are trying to prioritize it on those groups. Yes. You know, yeah. 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 And one of the things, Kevin, that um, Maria was saying earlier is that certainly from a birthright's point of view, um, although the rest of the world may be feeling that it's moving on slightly from COVID to different degrees, actually, um, it certainly feels when you read around this area that ethical issues and difficulties of the sort that you've talked about are, if not increasing, they're certainly as bad as they ever were and have been made far more difficult by COVID. Is that still the sense from a clinical perspective that things are still just as difficult as they were um, with, in, in sort of when we sort of saw ourselves in the height of the pandemic or do you, do you see things getting better from a resource perspective? No, <laughs> just, it's a fairly straightforward. It, you know, um, we didn't really have this probably resource before and, and it, and I, the COVID pandemic has just probably made it even worse, if, to be quite honest. And we, as Maria said, we're not out of it, uh, certainly in obstetrics, because they're the young, young, healthy group of people that have generally thought uh, it's not going to be a major effect on them. But actually, you know, what is it? I think it's one in six women that uh, currently in ICU are pregnant women. Have, unvaccinated mm -hmm. so it, you know it is a it is a serious issue um and certainly our local trusts have had more pregnant women with covid than the first time around so that's yeah. become a real difficulty and that's got a practical difficulty for the midwives going out to see them um they may be doubly vaccinated but you know you still have to get your ppe out you still have to so it isn't quite as easy and there is a lot more virtual consultations and you know although they work really well virtual consultations for some things sometimes you just need to to be sitting down face to face yeah especially yeah. if you're trying to drag out complicated issues you know behavioral issues because people over the telephone you're not seeing them you know and a lot of medicine is about actually physically seeing the body language and even Zoom, you know, I don't know how tall you are. I don't know, you know, these sort of things. You, know, you just, you, you don't know these things when yeah. somebody's sitting on a seat. So it, there are some useful things, but there are some real difficulties. Yeah, especially when you were working in the field of um, capacity issues and psychiatric issues, it's incredibly difficult, isn't it? Are you just going back to your scenarios, um, Kevin? Obviously, the, the sort of really difficult ethical tests between the C-section or not C-section when yeah. mother's life's at risk, but it appears to be her decision that that's the um, route that she wants to go down. And I think you said in that scenario that um, there was nothing to displace the presumption of capacity, that she, she seemed yes. to have capacity. Was that the position? Yes. Are, are you able to help us at all? Because I know it generated some interest in terms of what it's it was the real... doctor would have done. I think it's a real difficulty. Um, you know, we are faced not free, not very frequently, hopefully, uh, with this sort of scenario. But you, in the end, you have to kind of respect her wishes. But equally well, you have to, especially if she's got capacity, you have to point out to her, actually, if there is a very high risk of you dying from that operation, do you want to then leave your 
other child on their own and your parents don't want you to die, you know, and this is an inevitable condition that you've got now, but it, it, you know, we can't treat it at this minute. So you have to have that discussion and then ultimately that may sway one way or the other to say, well, actually I'd rather be alive at the end of this and you, and we'll deal with the baby the best way we can. Um, but if she still ultimately says cesarean section, you do everything you can to make sure she's going to be okay. So, you know, you, you do all that you can at that point, talk to the hematologist, make sure you've got plenty of blood and all, all the things. And, and as even if you're a consultant with quite a lot of experience, I would suggest that's the very time you need somebody else in with you because it's a really traumatic time if something goes wrong yeah. during this, you know, during the operation. Yeah. And you need to have clear thinking and practical thinking at the time. Yeah, and we've just had a question pop up in the chat, which is quite interesting. But if there is such a high risk, is it open to the clinician to refuse to perform the C-section? Because, of course, we're always told as lawyers that medics can't be compelled to provide treatment if you don't think it's in her best interests. Um, and if you look at cesarean section in that context, are you then being compelled by her request to provide that treatment and you're satisfied it's not right for her? Um, could you refuse? I'd you could refuse, yeah. But, yeah. You could refuse, um, and you know there's some merit in that. Uh, if you uh, and equally well, that's why you might get somebody else in to say, look, I, you know, I do not think this is in our best interest. But you know, in this period of time where I've actually got very little time to make the decision, I need other people in there help me and somebody may come say well actually we can there are things we can do during operations to to reinfuse their own blood and you know it might we do that for Jehovah's Witnesses and that mm. but often they've made a, a decision beforehand about what is acceptable for them and what's not and you go into an operation knowing that there is a risk of bleeding to death of that patient but you kind of know where your limits are and what you can do uh, and that this is a, this is a difficult but you you know a doctor could say well actually I don't think this is in your best interest and I'm not doing it yeah yeah really interesting and you can see all the conflicting ethical arguments there um which yeah. as you say when it comes up at three o'clock in the morning on a weekend with limited staff to to run it past and added pressures of time um I'm sure we can all see how quite how difficult that is I'm just giving a moment, see if there's anything else coming through um, in the chat. Don't think there is for now. Um, the only We've picked up already on the area that I was particularly interested in around advanced decision making um, when Maria referred back to it. Um, and the increase I think we're seeing in these difficulties. Just a little on the advanced uh, decision making. You know, even it isn't even happening very often in the elderly group of patients where you'd expect them mm. to be make, you know, who've got multiple medical problems and, you know, you might expect a respect document to arrive in there. No, it's, and it just doesn't. And yeah. then, and then, you know, the medics that at that time are faced with that, all the respect, you know, it's, things have changed or situations have changed. You can't rely on that documentation. And despite it being something that which all trusts have been trying to push forward, it just doesn't happen very often. Mm. So I think to happen to a, a relatively young, healthy population is even less likely. Yeah. Not, not because we're not wanted to do it. It's just, it doesn't happen very often. No, I know. And it's something that's been the subject of campaigns for years, really, in terms of trying to boost yeah. knowledge and education around it generally, like you say, around end of life planning as well. And, um, and in the general sense, um, much as it is with powers of attorney for health and welfare, that we still see low take up of those, um, yeah. despite their usefulness. I think there is there is also a from a kind of a legal point of view. There's also a lot of confusion between people whether you know, you'll get somebody coming in and say, "Well, I've got power of attorney," but actually, it's only for financial matters, yeah. you know. And and so as doctors, we've got to 
prime ourselves to say, can we see the documentation? Can we see that it's actually for health? Mm. And I think sometimes people come along with those documentation and they haven't realised that that doesn't give um, some warrant over their health matters. It's, and, in, and you end up with the conflict between um, relatives, sons and daughters, and, you know, they, the person there quite often because they actually haven't got the right bit of documentation. Yeah. But they think they have. And it's, it's really difficult from the, a practical point of view as the clinician faced with that. Because you don't want to fall out with people. No, especially not at those yeah. difficult times. And it's, it's yeah. a question really of how much it should really be on a, um, somebody involved in clinical care to be trying to explain the, the differences in that legal documentation. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can see the difficulties. I think they, they, they kind of need a new name. Yeah, it needs a it needs a name that differentiates two possibilities. Yes. So people yeah. could understand that, you know, because that isn't what happens in the in the real world. No, no. Um, and I know, as Maria said at the outset of her talk, these decisions that are being taken are, I think, as Maria, you put it, Maria, they're not taken in a vacuum. They are taken with a family behind it with a woman at the center of it yeah um all trying to find a way through these really difficult decisions that obviously have an impact on the woman and her family but also then an impact on the care team uh, that crossover really between um between it all uh, Marie, is there anything that you'd want to just sort of say by sort of concluding thoughts way of improving um the, the problems that you come across in terms of particularly the woman's voice and and hearing that loud and clear just before we close i mean one thing that we're really campaigning on at the moment is just about the need to really invest in maternity services for the longer term it just really strikes me the gap between kind of what we what clinicians are faced with on a day-to-day -day basis which is taking a very clinically framed decision and what the law requires in terms of actually knowing somebody and what's important to them particularly in terms of a cultural context you know I wonder how much some of those scenarios would have changed if somebody had been from a Somali background or something where there was, yeah, you know, a, um, a cultural bias against the Zarian or, you know, mm. and, but, but we, you know, we don't have enough capacity to kind of get to know those things in the way we should. And I think the starting point of that is having enough resources and enough time to, to really do that pre-planning properly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine Kevin would wholeheartedly agree with that. Absolutely. Resources yeah. and time, I think, for everybody. It, 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 the thing that's really interesting, and I think this has been a really interesting and good thing for you to put on with, um, because we have sometimes faced with these things, but I, I could go to lots of the um, our trust um, hierarchy who are trying to run the hospital and trying to run things, but actually, when it comes to, to practical decision making and how you decide one thing and the ethics around that, actually, that isn't their focus. Mm. Uh, and it's it's not kind of, you know, I've been in that situation as an exec of the trust. It's not it, it's not that they're not thinking about that, but they don't want to spend too much money or they don't want to overspend. You know, it's a real they they're in a really well what's the phrase rock and hard place sometimes you know and it, it's all very well as saying well we need all these things to happen but actually we're not very focused on what we really need to happen and where we need our resources to be mm. we're focused on targets and good things like that without necessarily be focused on the practical dilemmas and difficulties that we all have yeah because it's distant yeah yeah and then you encounter lawyers no doubt telling you what you should have done in terms of best practice and planning and, and the rest of it and the guidance from the court which must sometimes seem very otherworldly compared to actually what you're firefighting um Absolutely. there and now yeah no understood and that's why i think these sort of multidisciplinary chats are useful because we can end up training in silos otherwise and only hearing um, from people who do the same job as us so it's yeah. really helpful to have both of you here this afternoon to hear that other that other perspective it's all gone quiet on the chat so I think I'm going to take the chance to draw things to a close um obviously just remains really for me to say thank you to both of you very much for giving up your time um 
this afternoon. I think it has been really interesting. Um, I hope it's been useful and thought provoking for those delegates attending. Um, and as I say, they'll have the recording to look back through as well um, and the slides in due course. But I think as we've talked through those ethical as well as legal dilemmas, um, you can only ever really understand when you have the time to sit down with the people that are having to make those decisions in real time. It's very different from simply reading judgments or being at court and talking about it in that way. So um, yes, thank you all. And thank you to all of you who have attended. Um, as I say, you'll receive the recording and the link, um, and we're, we really hope that you found it useful as well today. I'm seeing some thank yous popping up um, in the Q&A. So um, yes, thank you, and we will call this an afternoon. Um, thank you all very much, and I'll close the webinar. Excellent.